point I'd like to read a few verses from Psalm 32 if you have a Bible with you please if you turn Psalm 32 and we'll read these verses and thoughtfully together. This is, this is God's word to us this morning. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groanings all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgive the guilt of my sin. Therefore let everyone who is godly pray to you, while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble, and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which has no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and brain, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love shrouds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upper and heart. We pray God's blessing on the name of precious word. At this stage I'd like to make the necessary announcements again. Warm welcome to everyone at Galilee. I trust that we will find time of rich blessing as we meet in God's house here today. Announcements for the coming service are as follows the prayer meeting on Wednesday at 8. Please remember that. 
We're having good times together as we meet together in God's Word as we pray on Wednesday. So Wednesday at 8, a prayer meeting. New uh, government rules mean that uh, you need to wear your mask coming and going out, out of the building. So if you could uh, please remember that, this compulsory to wear your mask but as you're coming, as you're going. If you feel more comfortable to wear it during the time of the service, uh, that's fine. <coughs> Services next Sunday will be special uh, weekend, special harvest Thanksgiving. It's hard to believe that we're around that our harvest Thanksgiving again. So next Sunday will be Harvest Thanksgiving Sunday. There will be a special collection uh, for the months of field. The months is coming along well. Tyler is in the present time and Nigel's hoping when he goes to get the joy around to do the, the trimming out the doors on and, and the bathrooms etc. Uh, get it out. So we're coming near the conclusion. We just need a final wee push over the line as far as the finances are concerned. In connection with that, there are envelopes in the pews, so please do take an envelope with you and uh, fill it up and bring it back next Sunday. And Roy tells me he's got bigger envelopes. If you need a bigger envelope, don't worry, don't worry, but I'm get you bigger envelopes. So please, we are very grateful to have uh, got so far, and it would be lovely if we could uh, have the pastor move, and Roy move on to the manse debt free, and that would be what we plan to do. So one final wee push and, and get us over the line, please, and thanks to all who have contributed so generously uh, over these past months towards that. Speaker, uh, next Sunday, uh, both services were planning, uh, all being well, two services next Sunday. The speaker will be Pastor Jim McGill, who's a Baptist pastor in Timor Baptist Church. He's originally from Mackenfeld, and uh, Jim will be with us next Sunday, God willing. Uh, AM and PM. So if you make that known, we're planning to have the two services uh, next Sunday. In connection uh, with that, uh, due to current restrictions, harvest decorations will be limited. Uh, the plan is to have a few arrangements of flowers set in strategic places. If you'd like to contribute uh, to the cost of providing those flowers, uh, flowers please see Sharon Stewart uh, about that. Also, Next Sunday, or Sunday, we're planning to have a collection of food items uh, for the food bank in Mahara. Um, and we've inquired, <coughs> it'd be very grateful to receive anything tins, cereals, biscuits, chocolate biscuits, that's for me. Uh, no, uh, but biscuits, if you can't buy those, or toiletries. So we'd be very grateful uh, for that. And if you bring those next Sunday, I'll leave them in the porch something there, put them in uh, next Sunday. So I think that's everything by the announcement of that. Thank you George, well, good morning, good to see you all here this morning, welcome to all online as well and uh, we give you a special welcome, appreciate you listening, hope you can listen or hear this morning, I believe we've been having one or two problems with sound over the past few weeks um, but hopefully uh, you'll be able to hear it okay. Uh, it's great to see the boys and girls again here uh, this morning. Now boys and girls, I wonder do you enjoy a good walk? It's that time of the year. Well, we see the, the autumn colours all appear, and, uh, and I know it can be really nice, especially when the leaves all fall out. It'll be great, like when all the leaves have fallen, and they've all gathered up in a whole pile, and you can uh, tramp through the, the leaves and give them a good kick, so you can send the leaves flying everywhere. And uh, maybe, boys and girls, you go out for a walk sometimes. I don't know where you live. You always have to be careful. Maybe you go with mum or dad or... Uh, somebody else or granny grand or whatever, you go to the park or something, you like to, to be able to get away for a good walk. I wonder, I wonder how far can you walk? I wonder can you walk several miles, can you walk five miles, maybe ten miles, or maybe after half a mile, maybe you're thinking, I wish I had my bicycle, and it would make life a lot, lot easier. Or maybe if you were out for a walk, you'd rather be doing something like that. Plenty of adventure. You can jump over trees and so forth and, and as I say, really enjoy all of that. And boys and girls, the reason we're looking at this morning is because we're coming to a story in the Bible where the people of Israel, God's people, the children of Israel, had to do a big long walk. 
But there's something they had to do on their walk. And I wonder, boys and girls, can you do this on your walk? Can you be quiet whenever you go for a walk? Or is it when boys and girls, whenever you go for a walk, you just talk, 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 talk the whole way around? Until you get right back, and maybe when you're out and walking, maybe mum or dad think, will they ever stop talking? Maybe they say this to you. They want you to be quiet. In fact, boys and girls, whenever you go for a walk, they don't want you to say anything at all. I think that'll be hard for some of us because whenever we go for a walk, we like to talk, and especially if we're out with family or we're out with friends on a walk. You see, the, the city we're looking at today, boys and girls, is the city of Jericho. We've mentioned this over the past number of Sundays. And you remember, boys and girls, about the spies that were sent by Joshua to go and check out the city. And they met a lady by the name of Rahab, and she looked after them. And she, she did something really special because she let them down a rope down the side of the wall. They were upsailing down the wall. And boys and girls, they spied out Jericho. They saw what it was like. They were able to go back and tell Joshua just what the city looked like. And then, boys and girls, last week, we know the children of Israel, they were making their way into the promised land where Jericho was, and they came to the Reds, or they, 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 they came to the Jordan River. We know that they crossed the Jordan River. It was a really special occasion. And boys and girls, Whenever we look at Joshua chapter 5 and chapter 6, we read about Jericho and there were lots of people still living in the city. But God had promised the children of Israel, this city, all of the promised land, that they, they, the children of Israel, could go and live there. But the people had to be all moved out of the way, first of all. And boys and girls, the people were living in the city, and whenever Joshua was thinking about how are they going to take over this city, what would they do? Well, Joshua had a visitor come to him. Maybe an angel, a commander of the army of the Lord. And, then, and the commander of the army of the Lord, he came to Joshua, and he said to Joshua, you're going to go to the city of Jericho, and I have great news for you because you're going to win the battle. Wouldn't that be brilliant if that happened all the time? Mind some boys and girls, if you were doing a math test in school and you're all afraid of it. But somebody said to you, don't you be worried about it because you're going to pass the test. You'd be absolutely delighted. So you would. And that's what it was like for Joshua. The commander of the army said to Joshua, whenever you go, here's what's going to happen. And he, he told Joshua all that was going to happen. And Joshua told the people, the children of Israel, what was going to happen. But boys and girls, what was going to happen was this, they were going to walk around the city. Not once, not on one day only, but they were going to be walking around the city for seven days. Once a day for the first six days. And then on the seventh day, they were to walk around the city seven times. But boys and girls, they were not allowed to say a word through it all. They weren't allowed to speak to each other. They weren't allowed to say to the person, how are you? They weren't allowed to say to the person, have you got any sweets for me? They were to be quiet the whole way around. And boys and girls, on day one, this is what happened. The, the children of Israel, they came right up to the city of Jericho. And there the whole city was in. And there uh, they walked the whole way around the city. In front of them, there were... There were, there were the priests who were, had the ram's horns and they were blowing them. They could make all the noise that they wanted. And there was the Ark of the Covenant where the, the, the Ten Commandments were inside. And that represented God being with them. And boys and girls, they were making all the noise for the people. They had to be really quiet. Not only in day one, but in day two. In day three. They were to be really, say nothing on day four. And they were to say nothing on day five. And boys and girls, they were not allowed to say a word on day six. I can see parents smiling because they'd be thinking this would be great. And then boys and girls came day seven. And what is it they were to do on day seven? They were to walk around the whole city seven times, a big massive city. And they were to walk around the seven times. But the first six times, boys and girls, they were to say nothing. 
Imagine doing that. Imagine walking around the whole of Tuggermore and even maybe Maharan as well. And the whole time, and you were to do it six times, and you were to say nothing. But then boys and girls came the seventh time. And the seventh time was, was different. It was special. Why? Because as they were going round, God told Joshua through the commander of the army of the Lord what they were to do in the seventh time. And Joshua, he said to the people, he said, Shout! And boys and girls, the people all shouted. And whenever they shouted, something amazing happened because down came the walls. There wasn't a big digger there to knock them down. But simply by them shouting, I'm not going to ask you to shout because I don't want you to scare all the grown-ups here. I'm sure you would love to have a good shout. But whenever they shouted, down came the walls and the children of Israel were able to take over the city and get what God had promised them, boys and girls. And do you remember this lady, Rahab? Because the spies went and looked for her. And her family, and they were kept safe. And the big, the big lesson we learn today, boys and girls, is this: God keeps His word. You see, we have the Bible, boys and girls, and God tells us in the Bible how we're to live our lives, what God wants us to do with our lives, and what God will do if we obey His word. And boys and girls, that's why God wants you to read His word. If you can't read it, get mum or dad or big brother, or big sister to read it to you, and you learn God's word and learn how God wants you to live life, and that you know God's help through life. God promised the children of Israel exactly what would happen if they obeyed Him, and they obeyed Him by not saying one word as they walked around all those times, and then when they shouted, God kept his word. Boys and girls, read the Bible, follow the Bible. The greatest command in the Bible is what? Is to love God with all of your heart, all your soul and all your mind. Will you do that by asking Jesus to be your saviour if you've never done so? And then you follow him day by day. So boys and girls, that's the story of the, 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 the walls of Jericho. You have it in your work packs. You can now do that for the rest of the service. And uh, I'm sure you'll be able to answer all the questions. Colour in the pictures. Big thank you again to Leslie for organising the packs. And uh, I think there's sweets in those packs as well. Um, I don't think they'll share as far as the front whenever I'm sitting. But you can enjoy those sweets. The worship group are going to lead us now in our worship. As they're going to sing, hear the call.
Turn please in God's Word uh, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're following on from uh, last week where we continue a series on the difference in the world. And uh, we're looking really at verse 17, but we're looking at verses 14 uh, down to the end of the chapter, verse 21, really, as we uh, base this verse in its context. And we rejoice really in all things new for those of us um, who are saved. That's the, the wonderful message of the, uh, of the gospel, of what Jesus Christ does in, in, in a heart and life of those who trust him. Um, he gives us a new heart and uh, we, we see how that impacts upon us um, in our lives. And um, say verse 17, we'll just read it uh, for the sake of time. Uh, time really is marching on this morning. Uh, verse 17, 2 Corinthians 4. A five. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Really, that's the big question we started off with last week. I'm not going to go into it in any depth at all. Just to recap, to uh, just to refresh you, uh, really, as we're thinking what uh, we're looking at last week, are we in Christ or out of Christ? In Christ is saved, out of Christ is not saved. And, and in verse 17, Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and uh, our prayer today is that all of us uh, are in Christ. If you're not in Christ, if you know you're not saved today, well, the great news is today you can be saved because God gives that opportunity still for you uh, to be saved. But really, as we looked in at the text last week, we noticed, first of all, in verse uh, verse 15, um, the, the new motive for living. Really, uh, that's what we're looking at. All things are become new. Um, so the first new thing we notice is a new motive for living. You see that in verse 15. He died for all, for, that those who live should, um, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. I trust that throughout this past week, that's been the desire of our hearts. Living unto the Lord, not living unto ourselves. Uh, the Lord has saved us, the Lord has given us life, the Lord has given us eternal life, and uh, uh, all glory and honour in our lives is to be given unto Him. And we looked at that last week, and what is, say, the challenge is, who are we living for ourselves? And, and uh, we, we explored it, and I trust that really we are living for Him each day. But what I want you to know, secondly, as we look at these verses, is the, is the new manner of regarding the new manner of regarding, what I mean by this, well, it's really how we see things in life. We have a new motive, we're living unto him, but how do we see things in life? Well, look at verse uh, 16. It says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. That may be probably in, in, in the authorised version, or I've been reading the, the New King James, maybe takes a, a, a number of readings to, to understand. And I think the NIV um, uh, renders it best. It says this in the NIV. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. In other words, whenever a person is in Christ, whenever all things have become new in our lives, and this is one of the evidences that we, we, can, uh, we can determine whether we are in Christ or not in Christ. But one of the evidences is, is how we see the people of this world and how we see the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the moment we get saved, we see people in the Lord Jesus Christ in an entirely new way. I laughed. I, I was reminded as I thought about this uh, over the last day or so, or yesterday, I was reminded of a cartoon. Some of you may have seen it. A wee picture cartoon has appeared, I think, in the papers. But it's shown a woman um, at the opticians. And she's sitting there at the desk and she's, um, she, she's speaking across the desk to the, to the optician. And here's what she says. She says to the optician, I'm returning these glasses I bought for my husband. He's still not seeing things my way and uh, I think we can laugh at that and, and um, but I, 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 I thought of that really whenever we thought of whenever we think of verse 16 here 
Because we have become new. But I wonder today, do we see things as God sees them? Do we see things as God sees them? As we live our lives since that moment and at the end hour, whenever we say that or we know that we have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour, do we see things differently? As people with the Holy Spirit within us, uh, the evidence is that uh, we will see everybody else around us in this world as, as, as completely different. Maybe, we, uh, maybe we're somebody and we've grown up in the, in, the, in the height of the troubles in Northern Ireland. And, 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 and what happened with so many people was we see things politically when we look at people. But I believe that whenever we come to fit, genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, how is it we'll see people? Well, we'll see people first and foremost as being in Christ or being out of Christ. We will see people as children of God or enemies of God. We'll see people as saved or unsaved, as people who are saved or people who need to be saved. Is that how we look on people each day? Do we have a heart for the lost? Do we have a heart for people? That as we look on them, an immediate thought is, or as we look upon the masses, uh, uh, whenever we see people, this maybe can't happen nowadays because they're not, we're not able to get together in big crowds, but, but whenever we look out on maybe the masses in a football stadium, or maybe some big event that the whole community has come together, how do we look on people? Do we look out and do we the heart that Jesus had. Remember when Jesus came to Jerusalem, what is it he did? He wept over it. Because there were people who were lost. Is that the, is that the heart that we have now? Uh, as we live our lives? Say it'll, it'll impact. It impacts here so clearly. How we look upon people, therefore from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Is what Paul said to the to, to the to the church in Corinth. I believe it also how it also impacts how we act towards others. Not only how we see people, but it impacts how we how we act towards people. Um, I believe it will change how we act towards Christians. Now we love Christians. Oh, before we were saved, maybe we looked at Christians and we thought. What a weird people they are. Maybe we looked at Christians and we thought, oh, they're weak people. They're needing somebody as the crutch for them to help them through life. Isn't that how the world looks on us? Maybe that's how we looked on Christians. And we, maybe we thought to ourselves, they're weird people. Going to pray? Sure, there is no God to pray to. Don't you pray under the wall? Don't you pray? Oh, whenever we get saved, how the Lord changed us and all. We look upon each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. As, as those who are part of our family, those who, who belong to the same family as ourselves. And I believe it will also impact how we, how we act towards our enemies. Oh, we, we, we love them as well. Isn't that what the scriptures exhort us to do? People look at, at Christians and they, they say, but look at the harm that these people have done to you, and yet you say you love them. How can you do it? You can only do it because of Christ, who dwells within us. James Montgomery Boyce, in his commentary, or in one of his books, he says this. I think it really summarizes it so well. He says, before we saw with our eyes physically, but we were spiritually blind. Now we see with spiritual eyes, and everything seems new. Before we were spiritually deaf, now we've been given ears to hear. We hear and respond to Jesus' teaching. Before our thinking was darkened, uh, we called the good bad and we called the bad good. Things of God were foolish to us, but now our thinking has been changed. We evaluate things differently, our minds have been renewed and are being renewed day by day. Before our hearts were hard, we hated God, we did not even care very much for others. Now our hearts are softened. Because our hearts have been, been remade, we now get, uh, give food to the hungry, we water to the thirsty, homes to prisoners, so homes to strangers, clothes to the naked, care to the sick, and comfort to those in prison. I think that's a beautiful description, or a great description, of what the new 
the new creation in Christ is like. Oh, whenever we looked in the Word, oh, we, we had little thought for it. We didn't see it as God said it. But then what is it Paul goes on to say in the verse, in the verse 16? Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. What's he talking about there? Whenever we were saved, how, whenever we were unsaved, how did we regard Christ? Think back to those days when we were not saved and we, we heard somebody uh, talking about Jesus Christ or we, we had somebody trying to witness to us about Jesus Christ. What was the thoughts that would have gone through our minds? But he says that as a new creation in Christ, that's no longer how we think all oh, today. But the Lord Jesus Christ, he's also different. He's also precious to us, is he not? Perhaps we despised and we rejected him, but now he's the fairest of 10,000 to our souls. He's the altogether lovely one. His name was a swear word, a curse word. But oh, whenever we hear that name now, his name is a name that is above every other name. A name that is so precious to us and we hate to hear people take his name in vain. Perhaps we laughed at the very thought of Jesus having done miracles whenever, whenever he lived in this world. Maybe we argued with Christians and we said, there's no way that could have happened. That it's, it's, it's all lies, it's all made up what's contained in the Bible. But now we can't thank him enough for his salvation because we know today that we are a miracle because he has saved us. It took a miracle to save us. It took a miracle to lift us from the depravity that we were in and to make us a new creature where we're rejoicing in his salvation. I think of the question that the Lord Jesus Christ asked the Pharisees in Matthew 22. Verses 41 and 42 says, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what do you think about the Christ? Oh, and on same day, we would all, we would give it to the Christians. And say, and I, Oh, he's so precious to us. He's everything to us. He's everything to us why? because we have experienced his transforming grace within our hearts and lives. We have seen what he can do in our life. We have seen how he has taken us as a wretched sinner and he has made us into a trophy of grace. He has, he has, he has transformed not only our life, but he has transformed our home as well. Maybe we were somebody and, 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 and we, were, we, we were addicted to the alcohol. The, the alcohol ruined the home. Maybe the drugs meant, meant more than the furniture. Maybe the drugs meant more than putting food on the table for the family. Then came the Lord Jesus Christ. He's transformed it all and today we can rejoice that we're a trophy of grace. All things have become new. That's what it's talking about here and in verse 17. We see the new motive for living. We see the, the new manner of regarding. I want you to notice finally with me in this one. The new, there we go. The new ministry of reconciliation. The new ministry of reconciliation, we see that there in verses 18 and 19, well, down to verse 21, but look here at verse 18. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. What this is talking about is this is, is us pointing people to Jesus Christ instead of trying to turn people away from him as we as we may have done before we ever got saved. Now the reality is we cannot reconcile anyone to Christ or, or to God. But through us, what we see here is through us, we see it in the free scripture, through us. People can be reconciled to God, no longer being at enmity with him, but instead becoming people who are accepted by him, who, who are saved by him and enjoying his wonderful salvation. You see, what is this sometimes Christians are heard to say? I've heard it many times a pastor. 
What I hear many people say is that, well, God has never given me a ministry. We talk about service for the Lord. We talk about doing things for the Lord. And sometimes I think we fall into the trap in the life of the local church. We think, well, who's the people who've been given a ministry? Well, it's the pastor. It's the people who are in the worship room. It's the people who teach in the Sunday school. Or we, we, we name all those things, but then there are many people saying, well, I'm not the pastor, I'm not in the worshiper, I'm not a Sunday school teacher, I'm not teaching in the BYM, I'm not in the Friday club, I, 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 don't, I don't be in any of these. God hasn't given me a ministry. Well, look here at what it says here in these verses. Verse 18, it says, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And at the end of verse 19, he says, has committed to us the word of reconciliation. You see, here's a ministry for all of us today who are saved. This is a ministry for all of us who are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not just a ministry for Sunday, but it's a ministry Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday as well. Look also at verse 20. I find this the most interesting statement. Verse 20. What does he goes on to say when he says, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation, reconciliation. Uh, he was committed to us the word of reconciliation. He says, now then, uh, that's sort of coming now that he's coming to the main point. He, he's saying, here's what you have. But really I believe what he's coming to the point now is he's going to say, right, what are you going to do with it? He says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. And what a lovely statement that is. What a lovely that title that is for those of us who are saved today. The reality is this. And maybe today you come in today and you felt when you were nothing. Maybe you felt you weren't important to God. Well, see today who you are. Because who are you? You're a royal ambassador for God. That's what I'm looking at today. Royal ambassadors. I bet you never, you never thought of that when you came in this morning. We're all royal ambassadors. Does that make us special or what? You see, we're an ambassador for the King of Heaven in this world. We're an ambassador for the King of Glory. We're an ambassador for the King of Kings. I was checking on the uh, on the internet, uh, I was googling it all, and, and uh, that's where we find so much information. I think the Queen, she has something like 170 ambassadors around the world. I would be pretty sure if I spoke to any one of them today. I said to them, "Do you feel privileged to be an ambassador for?" the commonwealth. I have a feeling it would be sort of sitting up almost to take notice that they're an ambassador. An ambassador for the Queen of the Commonwealth but here we are today and we all who are saved are ambassadors for the King of Glory. What's an ambassador's role? Well, it's not only to represent their country and the monarchy well in their appearance, but it's to proclaim the very message that they've been sent out for. That's an ambassador's role. They're given the message by the Queen to take out uh, to, to the 170 countries around the world. That's what their responsibility is. And what they're to do is they are to deliver the very message that they are, to, they are given. They're not allowed to change it. They're not allowed to add to it. They're not allowed to take away from it. They're not allowed to add their own interpretation to it. They are to take it and deliver it as given to them by the Queen. Is that not our role? Responsibility. In today's world. All scripture, we were considering it a few weeks ago, weren't we? Is given by inspiration. God. What's our message? Well, in a nutshell, it's, it's this. It's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Having shed His blood for the remission of sin, that all who put their trust in Him surrender their life unto Him, repent, we were looking at that last week, repent, will experience His wonderful salvation.
That's his message. And that's the message he wants us to live out in our lives day by day. That's the message he wants us to proclaim. Will we do it? Souls are perishing. People need the Lord. People you come in contact with that I will never reach as a preacher. They're but a breath away from a lost eternity. But the message is this. You have a message for them. I'm not saying you go in and you start preaching to them tomorrow morning. But it's living it out. When opportunities arise to share the good news of the gospel. What are you being? An ambassador with the ministry of reconciliation. Do you see those around you each day as people? who are separated from God. Do you see them as people whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life? But do you see that you can be the very means of them being reconciled to a holy God and also become new creatures in the Lord Jesus Christ? That's our privilege. Sometimes we can be afraid of it, we can think, what do I say? Well, we look to the Lord. He gives us the message. It's in his word. And we'll share it with people so that they come to know the Lord. The group's going to come and draw our time to a close with their song, facing a task unfinished. So the people need the Lord. May we seek to meet you. Thank you.
today for the precious name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name, no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. Many of us today, we rejoice. We've been saved by that precious name. Lord, we ask that you'll help us to live and to represent that name so well. Help us, our Father, in this world of sin. Lord, help us to remember that we are ambassadors, royal ambassadors to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. May we serve him well this week. And Lord, know that we're precious to you. And Lord, that you, your blessing will be upon us. Father, our prayer is those unsaved, that today, Lord, they'll come to him. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come and repent. Come and experience the new life that is in Jesus Christ and him alone. So, Father, bless your word. Part us with your blessing. Bless all online as well. And just for all of us, Lord, that throughout this week, we live unto you and glorify your name. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Thank you again uh, for joining with us. Thank you for joining online. And uh, do remember next Sunday being a harvest uh, Sunday. We look forward to that. God bless.